What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. It's your boy Nick here with Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. If you enjoyed my last video, which was the top eight early sleepers for the 2017 fantasy football video, then you'll probably enjoy this one. If you haven't checked that one out, go check it out here. Also, for this video, which is top five busts, uh, the blog post is already up on the website, so make sure you go check it out on the website, which I will put across the screen here. Sign up for the newsletter so you get notifications whenever I drop a new blog post uh, throughout the year. And then make sure you're following me on Twitter, which I'll also put here. All this will be linked in the description as well. And on Twitter, I post anytime I get a new video, anytime a new blog post comes out, anytime I just feel like talking shit online, that's where it's gonna be at. Make sure you're you're in tune with all three of those things. Like I said, today we're getting into my top five busts. Who's gonna bust a nut on your fantasy team in 2017? Again, as a precursor, I always say, they're not guys that I hate, they're just guys that I hate the value of where they're being drafted at. So if they're getting drafted at 10 and I think they should get drafted at 40, they're gonna be a bust in my opinion. So without further ado, let's talk numbers. All right, let's kick it off. And then this list is in no particular order. It's just the, the average draft position of these guys. So it's not like this first guy I hate more than anyone else. He just happens to be the first guy going off the board. Numero one, we got Todd Gurley of the Los Angeles Rams. Now, I don't hate Todd Gurley. I mean, he was like the third coolest dude on the worst season of Hard Knocks ever. That's gotta count for something, right? But for fantasy football in 2017, I hate you, Todd Gurley. If I could choose one guy out of the first two rounds that I'm avoiding at all costs, it's this guy. Gurley's going off the board 21st overall as running back 10. So my problem with Gurley stems back to his rookie season, which was phenomenal, but it really wasn't. I know the numbers were there and the overall picture looked good, but almost all of his production came from a four game stretch during that rookie season. It was from weeks four to weeks eight. They had a bye in the middle and they played against four of the worst rush defenses in the NFL at that time. So in those four weeks, Gurley ran for 566 yards, which is uh, about 142 rushing yards a game. He scored three touchdowns and he was averaging 6.4 yards per carry during that stretch. But when you look at that season outside of those four games, he was running back 24 in fantasy and he averaged 3.8 yards per carry. And you fast forward a year to last year, 2016, Gurley finished as RB19 in standard leagues, RB15 in PPR leagues, and he was a top five, top seven pick at worst in almost every single fantasy draft last year. He had the fifth most carries in the NFL. He had 278 carries and he had the, let me see, the 17th most rushing yards. 885 yards on 278 carries. He averaged 0.26 fantasy points. That's my phone. I ain't gonna get it because you're more important. So, so listen to me, don't even hear that phone right now. He averaged 0.26 fantasy points per opportunity, which was 60th among running backs in the NFL. He didn't rush for 100 yards in a single game. So the point is he was awful last year. The pass is the pass, it doesn't always carry over to 2017. What does it have in store for us now? I actually think it's gonna be worse for him. Obviously, you know, he's playing behind Jared Goff, the second year quarterback who was terrible last year. I'm not saying Goff's gonna be awful or his future is bad, but he's not gonna be that much better in his sophomore season. He has one of the worst, actually I think he was, it was the worst ranked run blocking line in the NFL last year. He was getting hit behind the line every single time he touched the ball. They did sign Andrew Whitworth um, this offseason, which should be a big boost to that line, but they're still a terrible line overall. But here's what gets me. So in 2015, his, his stellar fantasy year, Gurley had 21 catches, 21 receptions, right? And that was a big worry going into the next year. Can he be the third down back? Can he be the pass catching guy? Last year, he more than doubled his total from 21 in 2015 to 43 in 2016. And he still averaged 3.6 less fantasy points per game in PPR leagues. 3.6 less fantasy points every single game despite more than doubling his catch total. Let that sink in. That doesn't tell you how bad of a runner he was last year. I don't know. I like there's you need to just stop listening to me. So his catch is more than doubled and his PPR fantasy points went straight down the drain somehow. Now, the Rams went out and signed Lance Dunbar. I mean, Lance Dunbar was out almost all of last year, but he was the Cowboys pass catching back and he is supposed to play that third down back in this offense. 
reports that, um, you know, he already has that role. He's supposed to be similar to Chris Thompson in that Redskins offense where he comes in and is the primary pass catcher. So now Gurley, whose value would have been disgusting last year if he didn't get that many catches, is going to go back to his rookie season when he had 20, maybe 25 catches. So any upside he had in PPR leagues is now gone because uh, Lance Dunbar is there. So basically what you have in Gurley is a guy who's going to get 15 carries a game behind an awful offensive line in the NFL's lowest scoring offense. They averaged 14 points a game last year. And now he has no PPR upside because of Dunbar. A guy who's not going to score, he's not going to get the goal line opportunities. A guy who's not really going to catch the ball. And when he does get the carries, there's not going to be holes for him. I don't know. I understand the volume play here, why people think he's he could have a bounce back here. But for me, besides those four weeks, his rookie season, he was, he's been terrible in the NFL. That's it. I don't know how long you can kind of hang your hat on that. And there's not a lot of upside here, in my opinion. So in my opinion, he's a low-end RB2 in, in any kind of PPR format. Low-end RB2, and he's getting drafted as an RB1. So that, that's just a huge problem for me. Let's move over to number two on the list, the wide receiver out of Indianapolis, Dante Moncrief. Moncrief was on this list for me last year as well. Didn't like him, haven't liked him, and probably will never like him. He's currently the 50th player off the board, so you gotta invest a round five, a late round five, or around six pick in him as a 25th wide receiver. I don't think the hype's ever actually gonna die down on this guy just because of his build. He's got like that prototypical build, 6'2", 215, 220. His spark score coming out of college is so high. Um, but that's not even like prototypical in the NFL anymore with guys like Antonio Brown and Odell. So. I don't think that needs to be accounted for. We've seen plenty of guys like Doriel Green Beckham bust out and has nothing to do with their spark score. You know, Moncrief's been in the league for, for a minute now. This is going to be his fourth year, and he really hasn't done shit besides score touchdowns. He scored seven last year. He had seven touchdowns on 30 receptions last year. It's a ridiculously unsustainable number. And that's really where his value ends, that touchdown number. Because we've seen Moncrief play the full 16 games. He did it in 2015, and he ended with like 700... 30 yards or something like that. And I know a lot of 2015 was without Andrew Luck, you know, all those injuries he had, um, but that didn't stop T.Y. Hilton from going over 1,100, 1,200 receiving yards. So, so I want to read off a couple stats from one, the first one's from Evan Silva from Roto World and the second one's from Scott Barrett who works at, I think, PFF, Pro Football Focus. Dante Moncrief has reached 70 receiving yards one time over his last 21 games. Let that sink in for a second. Among all 54 wide receivers, with at least 200 targets over the last three seasons, so combined 200 targets over the last three seasons, Moncrief ranks bottom sixth in both yards per target and yards per route run. So he's super inefficient from a yard standpoint. And on the same spectrum, T.Y. Hilton, obviously opposite of Moncrief, is top 10 in both categories. So it's not a team thing. It's not an Andrew Luck thing. It's not a wide receiver head coaching bullshit on the Colts. It's Moncrief. And not to mention Moncrief was just straight ass after the catch last year. He averaged 2.5 yards after the catch, which is like bottom in the NFL. Obviously it's not end all be all because you have guys like Mike Evans who don't do that, but Moncrief is nowhere near the player Mike Evans is. So we have T.Y. Hilton, who's the unquestioned number one there. And then we supposedly have Dante Moncrief, who is the number two. To be honest with you, I'm not actually sold that he is the the be all end all number two in that offense. They signed Kamar Aiken. Kamar Aiken led the Ravens in receiving yards with like 950 in 2015, two years ago. So he was a really productive player for them. So I think a lot of the possession receptions might be split between Moncrief and Aiken. For me, I just, I don't see the upside there with Moncrief. Um, you know, he, he will be the number two or number three in the offense, but they also have Jack Doyle stepping in as a feature role. T.Y. Hilton obviously gets his 120 targets, whatever. And I think Kamar Aiken's going to make a little more noise than, than people expect. So going into this year, I just don't see the upside with Moncrief. And he's going, he's getting picked before guys like Larry Fitzgerald and Brandon Marshall, which to me is insane. So do what you want with that info, but Moncrief will not be on my teams. All right. So we hit on a running back. We hit on a wide receiver. Let's get to a Pig skin chucka, a.k.a. a quarterback. This is going to seem a little nuts to a lot of you guys. I'm going to move over to Nola, New Orleans, and I'm going to talk about Drew Brees as one of my top five busts this year. Early May, things could, things could change. He's getting picked 82nd overall as 
QB4. Drew's my homie, I hate it, had to be him. Bitch, you wasn't with me shooting in the gym. Huh. Bitch, you weren't with me shooting in the gym. And believe it or not, Breeze was, you can look at my videos from last year, Breeze was easily my favorite value play at quarterback for 2016 fantasy drafts because he was going as like QB8 and that paid off pretty well. But now the script is kind of flipped and I'm on the opposite side. It's weird because obviously he finished as QB3 behind Aaron Rodgers, Matt Ryan. He led the NFL in passing yards with over 5,200, but I still... I still have a case to be made here, I promise. The obvious case to be made is the departure of Brandon Cooks, who over his first two seasons averaged 1,160 receiving yards and eight and a half scores. So, you know, beyond the numbers, beyond the numbers that he provided uh, Breeze as a weapon, Cooks was one of very, very, very few players in the NFL that can turn an eight yard slant into a 90 yard touchdown, right? Him, Odell Beckham, Antonio Brown-ish. He doesn't really break away that much, to be honest. But, you know, there's like a, maybe five guys in the NFL that could do that. Cooks was one of them. And he did it multiple times last year. You had probably two or three games that Breeze was having a mediocre fantasy day where Cooks absolutely turned it around with a huge play. And, you know, that, that got Breeze the extra six, eight, ten fantasy points and shot him up from like QB 15 to QB 5, right? So I think the departure of Brandon Cooks is going to be a huge role in in a down year for Breeze. Something I want to touch on, I know a lot of people are, are talking about like the home versus away splits and Breeze is not good outside of the dome. He actually wasn't that bad last year uh, compared to what I thought it was going to be when I looked up the numbers. Big Ben is way worse. He did average 40 yards less when he was on the road, but the touchdown to interception ratio was like 20 to 7 at home and then 17 to 8 on the road. So it wasn't really that big of a difference. So I'm not, that's not even being factored into why I, I don't really love him. What, what I do think is another factor that plays into, into what I'm saying is Breeze was tied for ninth in terms of fantasy points per drop back. So that's a, that's a good fantasy efficiency measure for quarterbacks, right? Tied for ninth with Kirk Cousins. Um, he still finishes QB4 in fantasy. So what does that tell you? That tells you that the, the volume that he had was a big reason for why he uh, put up such good fantasy numbers. Now, he set a career high in passing attempts last year. He's been in the league for what, like 10, 12, 14? I don't even know. I didn't, I, didn't look, I didn't look to see that. I'm just saying, we all know he's been in the league for a really long time. And for him to set a career passing attempt uh, high last year only tells you that it's going to regress this year. And the fact that he was ninth in fantasy points per drop back is going to play a role. They went out inside Adrian Peterson. Uh, they drafted Alvin Kamara. So you have to just, you know, normally assume that they're going to be looking to run the ball more than they did last season. You know, Peterson's going to get his carries. So is Mark Ingram. So is Kamara. So what I think is the dip in volume is also going to hurt Breeze because he wasn't the most efficient player last year. So to wrap up Breeze, what I'm saying is I don't, I don't, by no means do I think Breeze is like done playing in the NFL. I don't, I didn't see a dip off in his physical ability, him throwing the ball uh, or anything like that. But when you look at the rest of the the draft board in terms of QBs, this is what gets me. Matt Ryan and Cam Newton are going 20 picks after Breeze. Derek Carr is going 30 picks after Breeze. And guys like Kirk Cousins, Dak Prescott, and Big Ben are going 40 to like 48 picks after Breeze. So like I said, I don't hate Breeze, but the fact that you can wait five rounds and get Big Ben who has Martavis Bryant coming back, Le'Veon Bell, Antonio, you know the weapons there. That's ridiculous. Take a skill player that you can pair with Big Ben or Kirk Cousins, and your team's going to be a lot more depthier. But you get the point what I'm making with Breeze. I think Cook's being gone, and his volume is almost naturally going to dip a little bit due to Peterson. So let's move to number four, another uh, ball carrier who switched teams in the offseason, we have Latavius Murray, who is going 82nd overall, budging hate. And I, I know this. I said this list was in no particular order, but if I can choose one of these dudes that I'd like, you couldn't pay me to take on this team, it would be Latavius Murray on the Minnesota Vikings. So he's going 82nd overall as running back 29. I'm honestly pissed that the Vikings took Dalvin Cook here only because Murray's ADP would have been even way higher and people would have wasted picks on him in like the fourth or fifth round. I mean, they're still going to waste picks on him, but it's just going to be much later in the draft. So my hatred for Murray, it's more than just the competition between him, Dalvin Cook, and Jarek McKinnon, which is a piece, obviously, because he's not, not even close to being the feature back there like he was in Oakland. Um, it just stems from Murray as a player. He's not good. He's stiff-hipped. 
He's just not an elusive guy. He's not very powerful. When you look at last year, he was running behind that Oakland line, right? And that Oakland line is arguably the best offensive line in the NFL. He averaged four yards a carry. It's not terrible. It's mediocre when you look at it from a bird's eye view. He did that on 195 carries, right? 4.0 yards per carry on 195. Every running back not named Latavius Murray in that offense averaged 5.6 yards per carry on 200 carries. So the same amount of volume, the yards per carry increases by a yard and a half when it's not Latavius Murray carrying the ball. Jalen Richard, DeAndre Washington, you know, Olamali, however the fuck you say that name. You get what I'm saying, though. No, Murray's put up back-to-back -back good fantasy campaigns. Like, you, he's very use, he was very useful in the last two years, but that's only because his touchdown numbers dramatically spiked his value. Now, he's moving from, like I said, the Raiders line, which was one of the best in the, off, uh, in the NFL, to the Vikings, which was arguably the worst run-blocking line in the NFL. I think they were ranked 31st by Football Outsiders. So, I mean, he's not going to get those goal line looks like he did last year. He's He had, uh, so nine of his 12 rushing scores came from inside the five, right? He had 16 attempts inside the five. The entire Vikings team between quarterbacks, running backs, anyone who touched the ball inside the five had 20. And there's no way Murray's getting every single one of those. So his volume's just naturally going to decrease there. And he's just running behind a shitty ass line. So I know the arguments, I understand the argument to be made that, you know, Murray got paid that big $15 million contract. Only 3.4 mil of it is guaranteed. I think that's the number. Um, and it's the fucking NFL. His dad is not the coach. He's not automatically seeing the field. If Cook outperforms him, which I believe is gonna happen, Murray's not gonna, he's not gonna be the starter there. I think Cook will be the starter within the first month of the season, if not by opening day, to be honest with you. I believe in Cook's talent. And I am so anti Latavius Murray. So what I think is Cook takes over as a starter, gets a lot of the early down work, gets some of the goal line work, uh, some receptions. And I think Latavius Murray all, uh, splits the goal line work with Cook, splits other carries between himself and McKinnon. McKinnon will get some, some passing work too. But Murray has virtually no PPR upside in that offense with Cook and McKinnon. He'll get some of the goal line carries, but I think Cook is definitely the guy there. And again, whoever is the guy is running behind a terrible fucking offensive line. So in my opinion, let me see, there's there's like a million guys I would take before Murray that is being drafted after him. It's Adrian Peterson I would take before him, Paul Perkins, Danny Woodhead, Rob Kelly, Kenneth Dixon, Doug Martin, Matt Forte. Man, the list of running backs that I would take before Murray that's being drafted after him just goes on forever. So, Mario, you can get the freak out of my house. All right, so this brings me to numero five. The last guy on the list, we've done running backs, wide receivers, quarterbacks. I want to throw one tight end in there, and that's Hunter Henry of the L.A. Chargers. 22-year-old tight end for the Chargers. Overall 87th pick as tight end seven off the board. Look at the, look at the guys being picked before him. Listen to these names. Gronk, Kelsey, Jordan Reed, Greg Olson, Tyler Eifert, Jimmy Graham, Hunter Henry. That means Delaney Walker's going after him, Kyle Rudolph's going after him, Eric Ebron, Jack Doyle, who I love, is going after him. And listen, I get I get the Henry appeal here. He's super young, super athletic. I, I think he's a no-brainer tight end one in the future, just not right now. Not as tight end seven. Last year, he scored eight touchdowns on 36 receptions, another stupidly high rate, which is kind of unsustainable. But when you look at what the Chargers did this offseason, they added weapons. They didn't lose weapons. Their first round pick, seventh overall, or eighth, whenever he went, Mike Williams, 6'4", 220. Huge target. Should easily take some red zone targets away from those tight ends. And now they get Keenan Allen back as well, who's going to be seeing a ton of targets over the middle of the field. Henry and Antonio Gates both had the same amount of targets inside the 10-yard line, which is seven. And Gates is back too. Now, Henry should be the the primary pass catcher, he should see a heavy workload in that role. But, you know, I would agree with this. Like, I would put him as tight end seven had Gates not returned. Or maybe like eight to ten, but I just think there's too many other weapons around him with Keenan Allen coming back, them drafting Mike Williams, they have Terrell Williams. Um, so many moving pieces there. So I think the fact that he's getting drafted at tight end seven factors in his upside into that pick. So if you're drafting him at tight end seven, like you're – banking on him having that breakout season. Because listen to the list of names that I said prior to him getting drafted, right? It's all dudes that are studs that have proved it before. And then you have guys like Delaney Walker who's going after him who's had back-to-back -back top five fantasy tight end finishes. Why not wait 10 picks and take Walker instead of Henry, right? 
Doesn't make sense to me. Like I said, I like Henry. I think he's the future no-brainer tight end one, but just not this year. And kind of to wrap it up, I wanted to throw a couple other names out here that I didn't do, put on the list, but that just are going at ridiculous spots. Derrick Henry at 62 overall, running back 22. So people are banking on Derrick Henry being an RB2. Are you comfortable having Derrick Henry as your RB2 in your lineup? He had less carries than Paul Perkins, Christine Michael, Matt Asiata last year. Like he said, DeMarco Murray is that guy. Derrick Henry's not just going to take over that feature role. I don't understand how he's going RB22, whatever. Jordan Matthews. Yeah, he can get infinite golf swing. Get the fuck out of here's emoji at pick 79. Brought in Alshon Jeffrey. Zach Ertz emerged. There's too much, too many weapons. Torrey Smith. Too much going on there for Matthews to keep getting picked at wide receiver three spots. Duke Johnson. Getting picked ever is a problem with me. I don't get what people are still waiting on him for to do. He he rushed for over 31 yards once the entire 2016 season. He scored three touchdowns on how many on 291 career touches. Isaiah Crowell is that dude this year in Cleveland, so Jeremy Hill needs to go undrafted. That's all I got. That's going to wrap it up. And if you enjoyed, please go give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new and welcome. If you have any comments, you have any questions, anything you want to ask, leave a comment down below. I'll hit you back. Head over to my website, go subscribe to the newsletter. You'll get updates on, on new articles. Follow me on Twitter, on my fantasy Twitter. I have a personal Twitter too. I'll, I'll link it all down below. Um, so go do all that shit. And I appreciate your time. Thank you for spending the time with me. I hope I provided you with some valuable insights because that's what we do here at Big Dog Got. And that's going to be all for today. So I'll see you in the next vid. Adios, amigos. I said, fuck it, I'm tearing holes in my budget Bag her like we in public, some take her ass out in public Ordered it up for late, told them butterflies, she'll love it She used to soda and nuggets, she really just started thugging I'm just hitting my pinnacle, you and pussy identical You like the fucking finish line, we can't wait to run into you